The story of Professor Henry Caldwell unfolded in the quiet, picturesque town of Ashfield, nestled in the rolling hills of North Carolina. Ashfield, with its quaint charm and historical significance, was home to the prestigious Ashfield University, a small liberal arts college known for its rigorous academic programs and close-knit community. It was the fall of 2019, a year that would mark the beginning of a dark chapter in the university's history. Henry Caldwell had been a fixture at Ashfield University for nearly two decades. He had arrived in Ashfield in the early 2000s, fresh out of graduate school with a Ph.D. in English literature from a top-tier institution. From the moment he set foot on campus, Henry exuded a confidence that quickly endeared him to both his colleagues and students. He was 58 years old, with a distinguished air about him, tall, with salt-and-pepper hair that only added to his appeal. His deep, resonant voice could command the attention of an entire lecture hall, and his sharp, piercing eyes seemed to see right through anyone who dared to meet his gaze. Henry's classes were always full, with students eagerly vying for a spot in his lectures. He taught courses on British literature, focusing on the works of Shakespeare, Dickens, and the Romantic poets. His passion for the material was evident in every word he spoke. He had a way of making the past come alive, of drawing parallels between the texts and the lives of his students, making them feel as though they were part of something larger, something timeless. His lectures were more than just academic exercises. They were performances, and Henry was the star of the show. Outside the classroom, Henry was just as charismatic. He often hosted informal gatherings at his home, a charming old house on the outskirts of town, where he would invite students to discuss literature, life, and everything in between. These gatherings were highly sought after, a mark of distinction for those lucky enough to receive an invitation. The students who attended felt privileged to be in the presence of such an esteemed professor, to share in his wisdom and insights. However, there was a darker side to Henry Caldwell, one that few were aware of. While he maintained the facade of a dedicated scholar and mentor beneath the surface, Henry harbored desires that went beyond the intellectual. Over the years, he had begun engaging in affairs with several of his female students. These relationships were always initiated under the guise of mentorship, private meetings to discuss their academic work, special attention given to their personal growth, but they inevitably crossed the line into something more intimate. To Henry, these affairs were thrilling. He enjoyed the power he held over these young women, the way they looked up to him, admired him, and sought his approval. He told himself that they were adults, capable of making their own decisions, and that what happened between them was consensual. But deep down, Henry knew that the power dynamics were skewed in his favor. He knew that his students, eager to please and desperate for his validation, were vulnerable to his advances. Yet he justified his actions by telling himself that he was helping them, that he was offering them something special, something they couldn't get from anyone else. The first affair had started innocently enough, a late-night conversation in his office with a student who was struggling with her coursework. Henry had offered her a drink, and they had talked for hours, long after the rest of the campus had gone to sleep. One thing led to another, and before he knew it, they were in each other's arms. It was exhilarating, and Henry found himself drawn to the excitement of it all, the secrecy, the thrill of doing something forbidden. As the years went by, Henry's affairs became more frequent. He had become skilled at identifying the students who were most susceptible to his charm, the ones who were vulnerable, insecure, or simply infatuated with him. He would shower them with attention, make them feel special, and then, when they were fully under his spell, he would make his move. Each affair was different, but they all followed a similar pattern. Initial hesitation on the part of the student, followed by a gradual erosion of boundaries until they were fully entangled in his web. Henry was careful, though. He made sure that none of the students ever talked to each other about their relationships with him. He emphasized the importance of discretion, framing it as a way to protect their reputations. And for the most part, his students complied. They were too enamored with him, too fearful of what might happen if their secret got out to ever say anything. 
but as time went on, the weight of these secrets began to take a toll. By the fall of 2019, rumors about Professor Caldwell's inappropriate behavior had begun to circulate among the students and faculty at Ashfield University. It started as whispers in the hallways, small fragments of conversation overheard by those who were paying attention. A student who had been in one of Henry's classes mentioned to a friend that she had been invited to his house for a private meeting. Another student confided in her roommate that she felt uncomfortable with the way Henry had been treating her, that he seemed to be crossing boundaries that made her uneasy. The tension on campus grew as these rumors persisted. The faculty, though aware of the whispers, largely chose to ignore them. Henry Caldwell was a respected colleague, a brilliant scholar who had brought prestige to the university. No one wanted to believe that he was capable of such behavior. And so the administration turned a blind eye, allowing the rumors to continue unchecked. But Henry wasn't oblivious to what was happening. He could sense the shift in the atmosphere, the way students would whisper as he walked by, the furtive glances exchanged between them. He knew that his secrets were at risk of being exposed, and the thought filled him with a deep sense of dread. Yet he couldn't bring himself to stop. The thrill of the chase, the power he felt in those relationships, was too intoxicating to give up. So, he continued, all the while telling himself that he was in control, that he could manage the situation. As the semester progressed, the rumors about Henry's behavior became harder to ignore. A few students, emboldened by the support of their friends, began to speak out, sharing their experiences with a trusted faculty member. These stories were troubling, accounts of late-night meetings that turned into something more, of feeling pressured to engage in a relationship they weren't comfortable with, of being made to feel special only to be discarded once Henry had gotten what he wanted. The faculty member, shocked by what she was hearing, brought the matter to the attention of the university administration. An investigation was quietly launched, but it was clear that the university was more interested in protecting its reputation than in seeking justice for the students involved. Henry was informed that there were concerns about his behavior, but no formal action was taken. He was simply told to be more careful, to avoid situations that could be misconstrued, Henry Caldwell, the charismatic professor who had once been the pride of Ashfield University, was now a man on the brink of ruin. His carefully constructed life was beginning to unravel, and he could feel the walls closing in around him. But rather than face the consequences of his actions, Henry chose to double down, to continue his behavior in the hopes that he could maintain control. What Henry didn't realize was that he was playing a dangerous game, one that would ultimately lead to his downfall. The students he had wronged were no longer willing to stay silent, and the secrets he had tried so hard to keep hidden were about to come to light. On the morning of October 15, 2019, Emily Parker, a 21-year-old transfer student, arrived at Ashfield University. She had come from a larger state university, eager to take advantage of the small, focused academic environment that Ashfield offered. Known for her intelligence and passion for literature, Emily aspired to a career in academia where she could share her love of texts with future students. That Tuesday, Emily attended Professor Henry Caldwell's advanced British literature class for the first time. She had heard of his reputation as a brilliant lecturer who could bring challenging texts to life. Excited to learn from him, Emily was determined to stand out in his class, viewing it as an important step toward her future goals. Henry Caldwell noticed Emily right away. She was not only strikingly attractive, but also carried herself with confidence and ambition, traits that immediately drew his attention. As weeks passed, Emily quickly established herself as one of the best students in the class, regularly contributing insightful comments during discussions. Caldwell, impressed by her sharp intellect and analytical skills, began to take a special interest in her, which went beyond purely academic matters. Caldwell started by praising Emily's work in class, offering her encouragement and validation that made her feel she was on the right path. Emily admired him greatly, not only for his knowledge, but also for his ability to make literature engaging and relevant. 
His enthusiasm was infectious, and she found herself increasingly drawn to him. Soon, Caldwell began inviting Emily to his office hours, ostensibly to discuss her academic future. He presented these meetings as opportunities for personalized advice, and Emily, flattered by the attention from such a distinguished professor, readily accepted. Initially, their meetings focused on her coursework and career plans, but as time went on, their conversation shifted toward more personal topics. Caldwell was an experienced manipulator, having pursued similar relationships with students before. With Emily, the process was smooth. She was trusting, eager to please, and increasingly infatuated with him. As their relationship deepened, Caldwell began to blur the lines between professional and personal interactions, testing her reactions with compliments and subtle advances. Before long, their relationship crossed the line into intimacy. Caldwell orchestrated their first physical encounter carefully, exploiting Emily's trust and admiration. The encounter left Emily thrilled, but also confused. She had never imagined herself involved with a professor, especially one as esteemed as Caldwell. Yet, she was deeply infatuated, believing their connection was genuine and unique. What Emily didn't realize was that she wasn't the only student involved with Caldwell. He had maintained similar relationships with others, carefully keeping them separate, so none would suspect they weren't his sole focus. As Emily grew more entangled in the relationship, her academic performance began to decline, consumed by the time and energy she devoted to Caldwell. As the semester progressed, Emily became more deeply enmeshed in Caldwell's web. Her academic work suffered as she increasingly relied on him, believing he would help her recover. But Caldwell's manipulation was pushing her further into a precarious situation, one with serious consequences she couldn't yet foresee. As the semester drew to a close, Emily Parker began noticing subtle but disconcerting changes in Professor Henry Caldwell's behavior. What had once been a passionate and engaging connection began to feel cold and distant. Henry, once so attentive, started canceling their meetings with increasing frequency, offering vague excuses or sometimes none at all. In class, he avoided making eye contact with her and seemed to withdraw from their usual exchanges. The warmth that had once characterized their relationship was replaced by an unsettling detachment. Emily's unease grew with each passing day. She couldn't shake the feeling that something was amiss. Unable to ignore the nagging doubts any longer, Emily decided to investigate. She started by casually engaging in conversations with other students, subtly steering the discussions towards Henry. What she discovered confirmed her worst fears. Henry had been having affairs with multiple students, often overlapping in time, and each one thought she was special. Some of these students had been deeply hurt and humiliated when they realized they were not the only ones. Emily was not alone in her experience. There were others who had fallen for his charm only to be discarded when he moved on to his next conquest. The revelation was devastating. Emily felt a surge of anger and humiliation as she came to terms with the fact that she had been manipulated and used. The man she had admired, even adored, was nothing more than a serial seducer, exploiting the trust and vulnerability of his students for his own gratification. The sense of betrayal was overwhelming, shattering any lingering feelings she had for him. Determined to confront Henry, Emily sought him out, refusing to be dismissed or ignored. When she finally cornered him, Henry tried to downplay his actions, spinning excuses and attempting to manipulate her into silence. He claimed that their relationship had been special, that she was different from the others. But Emily saw through his lies. The charm that had once captivated her now seemed hollow and insincere. The confrontation left Emily feeling more resolved than ever. She was no longer the naive student who had fallen for his manipulations. The anger and hurt she felt gave way to a determination to hold him accountable. She realized that she was not just another one of his victims. She was in a position to do something about it. Emily began to plot her revenge, but she wasn't the only one. Other students, too, had suffered at Henry's hands, and they were ready to join her in exposing him.
In the aftermath of Emily's discovery about Henry Caldwell's manipulative and predatory behavior, she realized that she wasn't alone in her suffering. Two other students, Sarah and Jessica, had also been deeply hurt by Henry's actions. Like Emily, they had been lured into relationships with him, only to be discarded and left to grapple with the emotional and psychological fallout. Their shared experiences created an immediate bond between the three women, who found solace in each other's company as they processed the betrayal they had endured. At first, their conversation centered around how they could expose Henry's misconduct to the university authorities. They discussed filing formal complaints, gathering evidence, and rallying support from other students who had suffered similar fates. However, as they delved deeper into their plans, doubts began to surface. All three women were painfully aware of how power dynamics at the university worked. Henry was a well-respected professor with a sterling reputation. They were young women who might be dismissed as disgruntled students, or worse, discredited entirely. The more they talked, the more they realized that a formal complaint might not bring the justice they so desperately sought. It was during one of these late-night discussions in the small, dimly-lit apartment they often gathered in that Emily voiced the thought that had been simmering in the back of her mind. Her anger had been growing ever since she confronted Henry, and with each passing day, it festered into something darker. She suggested that perhaps the only way to truly stop Henry and make him pay for what he had done was to take matters into their own hands. Her voice was steady but laced with the simmering rage she had been trying to control. At first, Sarah and Jessica were stunned into silence. The idea of murder was unthinkable, an extreme response to their situation. Yet, as Emily spoke, laying out her reasoning, the shock began to wear off, replaced by a chilling sense of justification. Emily argued that Henry had gotten away with his behavior for too long, that the legal system might never hold him accountable for the pain he had inflicted on them and others. She painted a picture of a man who would continue to exploit and destroy lives unless someone stopped him. Sarah and Jessica listened, torn between their lingering moral reservations and the anger that had taken root in their hearts. Emily's words resonated with them on a visceral level. They had each been through so much. Humiliation, emotional manipulation, and betrayal. The idea that Henry might walk away unscathed, free to continue his predatory behavior, was unbearable. Slowly, their initial shock gave way to a cold, calculated resolve. They began to rationalize the plan, convincing themselves that what they were considering wasn't just an act of vengeance, but an act of justice. Henry had caused them unimaginable pain. Now, it was time for him to experience the consequences. The plan took shape over the next few weeks. The three women met regularly, carefully crafting each detail of what they intended to do, they discussed every possible scenario, from how they would carry out the murder to how they would cover their tracks. Emily, who had become the de facto leader of the group, was meticulous in her planning. She knew that one mistake could unravel everything and land them all in prison. But she was driven by a singular purpose, to ensure that Henry would never hurt another student again. On the night of December 12, 2019, the air was thick with anticipation and tension as Emily, Sarah, and Jessica prepared to execute the final stage of their plan. The three women had carefully selected this date, knowing it would be one of the last opportunities before the holiday break when the campus would empty and people's attention would be elsewhere. They had chosen an isolated cabin deep in the woods, far from Ashfield University, as the site where their confrontation with Henry Caldwell would take place. This location, secluded and quiet, offered them the privacy they needed to carry out their plan without fear of interruption. The cabin itself was a small, rustic structure, once used as a retreat by faculty members, but now largely forgotten. Emily had discovered it during one of her many walks through the woods, a place where she had often gone to clear her mind in the months leading up to this moment. Its remote location and neglected state made it the perfect setting for what they intended to do. There would be no one around for miles to hear or see what transpired, 
and that was precisely what they needed. In the days leading up to the meeting, Emily had played her part flawlessly. She had contacted Henry, suggesting a private farewell meeting before graduation, under the pretense of wanting closure and to express her gratitude for his mentorship. She had hinted that she would be bringing along Sarah and Jessica, presenting it as a final chance for them to express their appreciation as well. Henry, ever the narcissist, had readily agreed. He was confident that he could control the situation, as he always had, believing that his charm and authority would easily diffuse any tension. On the evening of December 12th, as dusk settled over the campus, the three women made their way to the cabin. They traveled separately, careful not to draw any attention to themselves. Each of them carried a piece of the plan with them. Sarah had brought a bottle of wine, Jessica a concealed weapon, and Emily the heavy object that would soon become instrumental in their grim task. They arrived at the cabin just before nightfall, the shadows lengthening as the forest grew darker around them. Henry arrived shortly after, his car kicking up a cloud of dust as it pulled into the clearing. As he stepped out of the car, he noticed the eerie quiet of the place, but dismissed it, focusing instead on the evening ahead. He expected a simple meeting, perhaps some emotional goodbyes, but nothing he couldn't handle. However, as he approached the cabin and saw the three women standing together in the doorway, something in their demeanor gave him pause. There was no warmth in their expressions, no trace of the admiration they had once shown him. The moment Henry entered the cabin, the atmosphere shifted. The door closed behind him with a heavy thud, sealing him inside with the women who had come to confront him. He immediately sensed that something was wrong. The usual confidence he carried with him began to falter as he observed the cold, determined looks on their faces. They didn't offer him a seat or the glass of wine Sarah had placed on the table. Instead, they stood in a tight formation, blocking his path to the door. Emily was the first to speak, her voice steady and devoid of the deference she had once shown him. She began by confronting him with the truth about how he had manipulated and deceived her, how he had used his position of power to exploit her trust and affection. Her words were sharp, each one a calculated strike at the façade Henry had so carefully constructed. As she spoke, Sarah and Jessica added their voices, each detailing the harm he had caused them. They recounted the emotional manipulation, the broken promises, and the deep psychological scars that he had left behind. Henry, realizing the gravity of the situation, attempted to talk his way out of it. He tried to deploy the same charm and persuasion that had served him so well in the past, but it was no use. The women had seen through his act, and they were no longer susceptible to his manipulations. Their resolve was unshakable, their anger and sense of betrayal fueling their determination. As the confrontation intensified, Henry grew desperate. He attempted to leave, but the women stood firm, blocking his exit. Panic set in, and in a moment of rash desperation, he lunged at Emily, hoping to overpower her and escape. But the women were prepared. Jessica, who had been waiting for such a move, quickly stepped in, the weapon she had concealed now in her hand. The struggle that followed was fierce but brief a chaotic flurry of movement and raw emotion. In the heat of the moment as Henry fought to break free, Emily grabbed the heavy object she had brought with her, a blunt instrument she had chosen for its effectiveness. Without hesitation, she struck Henry, the blow landing with a sickening thud. The force of the impact stunned him, and as he staggered, the other women joined in, driven by the same mixture of fear, anger, and a desire for retribution. The fight was brutal and messy, the cabin walls echoing with the sounds of their struggle. It was Sarah who delivered the final blow, her hand trembling as she brought the weapon down on Henry's skull. The room fell silent, the only sound the ragged breathing of the three women as they stared at what they had done. Henry lay motionless on the floor, the life drained from his body. The reality of their actions began to set in, the weight of the murder pressing down on them like a suffocating shroud. For a moment, None of them moved. The adrenaline that had propelled them through the confrontation began to ebb, replaced by a cold, creeping dread. 
They had done what they had set out to do. Henry was dead, and with him the threat he posed had been eliminated. But as they stood over his lifeless body, the enormity of their crime became undeniable. They had crossed a line from which there was no return. Emily was the first to break the silence, her voice shaking as she reminded them of the next steps in their plan. They needed to clean up the scene, to make it look like an accident, just as they had rehearsed. With mechanical precision, they set to work, wiping down surfaces, disposing of evidence, and carefully staging the scene to suggest that Henry had met with a tragic, unforeseen accident. It was a meticulous process, one that required them to push aside the horror of what they had done and focus solely on the task at hand. By the time they were finished, the cabin was eerily quiet, the only sign of the violence that had occurred a few drops of blood that had been missed in the frantic cleanup. The women left the cabin under the cover of darkness, each taking a different route back to campus, just as they had planned. Their alibis were solid, their stories rehearsed to perfection. They had done everything they could to cover their tracks, but the guilt of their actions would be much harder to erase. As they parted ways that night, there was no celebration, no sense of triumph. Instead, there was only a heavy, oppressive silence, a mutual understanding that their lives had been irrevocably changed. They had sought justice, but in the process, they had become something they could never have imagined. The murder of Henry Caldwell would haunt them, a dark secret that bound them together in a conspiracy of silence. The morning after the murder, December 13th, 2019, dawned cold and bleak. Emily, Sarah, and Jessica woke in their respective dorm rooms, the events of the previous night replaying in their minds like a relentless nightmare. They had disposed of Henry Caldwell's body in the early hours of the morning, dragging it deep into the woods, far from the cabin where his life had ended. They had buried him in a shallow grave, hoping the winter's cold and the remoteness of the location would keep his remains hidden long enough for them to escape suspicion. As the days passed, the women tried to resume their lives, putting on the appearance of normalcy. December 15th saw Emily attending her classes with a numb detachment, her mind constantly drifting back to the cabin and the sound of Henry's last breath. She threw herself into her studies, hoping that academic focus would drown out the guilt that gnawed at her. Jessica, on the other hand, became withdrawn, barely speaking to anyone, her bright demeanor dimmed by the weight of what they had done. Sarah, the most fragile of the three, was haunted by vivid nightmares that left her shaking and sleep-deprived. By December 18th, the strain of their secret was beginning to show. Sarah, unable to cope with the overwhelming guilt, started to falter. She avoided the others, terrified that any contact with them would break her fragile resolve. She stopped attending classes, her grades plummeting as she isolated herself in her room, consumed by fear and regret. On December 22nd, the three women gathered in Emily's room, the first time they had been together since the night of the murder. The tension was palpable as they discussed what to do next. Emily insisted they stick to their plan, reminding them that they had come this far and couldn't afford to fall apart now. Jessica agreed, though her voice was laced with doubt. Sarah, however, was silent, her face pale and eyes hollow. She didn't have the strength to voice her fears, but it was clear she was at a breaking point. Christmas came and went, the holiday cheer around them a stark contrast to the darkness they felt inside. On January 5th, 2020, as the new year began, Sarah reached her breaking point. Unable to bear the guilt any longer, she made her way to the local police station. She confessed everything, the murder, the disposal of Henry's body, the guilt that had been eating away at her. Her confession was a desperate act, driven by a need to unburden herself, regardless of the consequences. The police, initially skeptical, were soon convinced by the detail in Sarah's account. On January 6, 2020, they arrested Emily and Jessica, who were completely blindsided by Sarah's betrayal. The news of their arrest spread like wildfire through Ashfield University, shocking students and faculty alike. 
Henry Caldwell, the esteemed professor, was revealed to be missing, and the police search quickly led them to the shallow grave in the woods where his body had been hastily buried. The media seized on the story, turning it into a sensationalized tale of betrayal, murder, and scandal. By January 10th, the case had become a nationwide headline, with reporters camped outside the university and the courthouse, eager for any new details. The trial began on February 15, 2020, and the courtroom was packed with spectators, journalists, and those who had known Henry and the three women. The prosecution laid out the gruesome details of the murder, while the defense attempted to paint a picture of three young women driven to desperation by Henry's manipulations. Throughout the trial, Emily sat in the courtroom, her face a mask of stoicism. But inside, she was unraveling. The testimony from Sarah and Jessica, recounting the events of that fateful night, was almost too much to bear. The prosecution portrayed her as the mastermind, the one who had led the others down the path to murder. The defense, while sympathetic to the trauma Henry had inflicted, could not deny the brutality of the crime. On March 10, 2020, the verdict was delivered. All three women were found guilty of murder, though their sentences varied based on their involvement. Emily, seen as the ringleader, was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Jessica received 25 years, her sentence reflecting her active participation in the murder. Sarah, whose confession had led to their capture, was given 15 years, her sentence reduced due to her cooperation and evident remorse. As Emily was led away in handcuffs, the reality of her situation finally sank in. The bright future she had once envisioned, a career in academia, a life dedicated to literature, had been replaced by the grim reality of a prison cell. The desire for revenge, which had once burned so brightly, now seemed a hollow justification for the ruin of three lives. In the months that followed, as she settled into the monotonous routine of prison life, Emily had plenty of time to reflect on the choices that had led her there. She replayed every moment, every decision in her mind, trying to pinpoint the exact moment when everything had gone wrong. But no matter how many times she went over it, the result was always the same. She had let her anger and desire for justice consume her, leading her down a path of no return. The media frenzy eventually died down, and the world moved on, but Emily's story remained a cautionary tale. It served as a grim reminder of how easily the line between justice and revenge can blur, leading even the brightest minds into darkness. For Emily, there was no redemption, no second chance, only the long, empty years ahead, filled with the echoes of a life that could have been.